So, uh, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to our third meeting of Bright Garden Voices. Um, Bright Garden Voices is a platform for Azerbaijani and Armenian voices to come together and where we have an audience. Uh, each meeting has a specific topic and we will discuss them with questions made by the moderators and uh, also the audience can participate in the end. Uh, this project is an initiative of three individuals who have no um, association with any government or organization. It's an independent endeavor. Our meeting today uh, is about identity, um, as you might have seen in our flyer. Um, the questions we ask ourselves today is what are the main pillars of Armenian and Azerbaijani identities? How much does each side know about the other self perception? And for this, we have uh, two guests who focus on these issues, Garine Palanjan and Nasrin Gadimola Akbulut. We're gonna introduce them in a second. Um, first, let me introduce myself. My name is Diego Arduan, I'm from Argentina. I've been focusing on Armenian studies for a long time. And uh, during the last war, I decided to uh, do something to uh, create some breaches between Azerbaijani and Armenian voices. Um, I'm joined by one of my co-hosts, um, Aidan. Welcome everybody to our third meeting. My name is Aidan. Uh, I'm from Azerbaijan. Uh, I'm from uh, that generation of people in Azerbaijan that grew up in the aftermath of the first Karabakh war. And that brought with itself a lot of uh, pain and a lot of feelings of injustice. Uh, but going through the Second Karabakh War was traumatic in its own way, as I had um, personal ties with family members that lived in Genja, which was one of the cities that was bombed during the conflict. Um, but today I'm here as a moderator of Bright Garden Voices, and I am happy to see you all. Um, the reason I'm doing this is because I believe that it is uh, extremely important to have uh, voices of regular Azerbaijanis and Armenians heard. And uh, it's also really important uh, that these voices are able to reach each other. As a moderator, I might express uh, opinions and they are strictly my own, don't aim to represent any um, opinion of any organization, uh, state or group. And with that, I'll pass the word to Arnold. Thank you, Aidan. Hello everyone, I am Arnold. I am Armenian and I am joining from the United States. I am only a moderator in this program. And if I express any views, I am only representing myself and not any nation or group nor organization. The wounds and losses of the recent war are still very fresh, especially for Armenians. And on top of that, there is the POW situation. Uh, it is not in spite of all of this, but in my opinion, because of this difficult post-war situation that uh, ordinary people from both sides deserve to have their voices heard. Now let's go to Diego for today's uh, meeting topic. So as I briefly mentioned already, uh, today's topic is identity. Um, Matters related to identity are hotly disputed among Azerbaijanis and Armenians, often carrying various preconceptions and stereotypes. Uh, having gone decades without contact, the new, the, without contact, the new generations of Azerbaijanis and Armenian know very little about the other sense of national identity. Our guests today will discuss the main pillars that constitute the identities of both peoples and how these identities are constructed and reconstructed. We'll go now to the agenda with Arnold. All right, so let us move on to today's agenda. So each of our meetings will generally have two guests, individuals who are in some way involved with matters relating to Armenians or and Azerbaijanis. We have already introduced the topic of today's meeting, identity. Next, we will have a discussion with our wonderful guests. After this, we will open the virtual floor to the audience for questions. You will forward your question as a private chat to Diego. 
if you have your camera and microphone on, then we will unmute, unmute you and as you, you can ask the question yourself. You may remember that you may also use your first name only or a pseudonym if you don't want your name to be called um, or displayed. We will end the meeting with a few closing remarks. And lastly, the meeting will be recorded and made available online. Now let us go to Aidan for the house rules. As you can see uh, on the screen, we have some basic house rules that we want to have for these meetings. We ask all of you as participants to uh, comply with them. The house rules are pretty simple. We uh, don't uh, tolerate any insults, slurs, or disrespectful language. Um, we discourage you from asking provocative or aggressive questions. Um, we don't engage in denialism of events, and we ask you to, first and foremost, to empathize with the other side uh, instead of making accusations. Let's not make generalizations about any ethnicity and try to avoid discriminatory language. Um, of course, uh, it's really important to mention that we might not always agree with each other, but that's more than okay because agreeing to disagree is also part of our pillars. Uh, all participants that are here today, they only represent themselves and they don't aim to represent any of their governments or nations. Thank you. So with that note, um, let's actually move on to our first participants, to our first guest, which is Garina. And uh, I'd like to introduce Garina. Garina Palanjan is a PhD candidate in educational policy and evaluation at Arizona State University, Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College in USA. And as a uh, border thinker, Garina uses a decolonial lens for the dissertation, uh, for her research, dissertation research in Armenian education to explore how borders and memories of bordering uh, practices and experiences redefine education and identities. Welcome, Garina. Thanks for coming on. All right. Our next guest is Nazreen. Nazreen is a research fellow at the Center for International and European Studies at Kadir Has University in Istanbul, Turkey. She wrote her doctoral thesis on the correlation of national identity and regional fragmentation in the South Caucasus and the prospect of building a common identity in the region. Nazreen and Garine, it is a pleasure having you with us today. So now let's start by going to Nazreen first. So Nazreen, um, what uh, would you can- Arnold, uh, yes. first of all, just a brief thing. Um, since today's topic is identity, uh, we ask beforehand to our guests to come up with a, a conjoined, so to say, uh, definition of what identity is so that, just so that everybody here can like um, know what we're talking about when we talk about identity. So I'm just gonna read it out briefly. Um, well, it's what's now on screen. National identity is a type of uh, social self-definition built upon stories and myths of common territory, homeland, mm -hmm. language, religion, culture, and history. National identity is not fixed and can change over time. And while it may be an imagined concept, it is also very real. So with this, there's the definition in mind. We'll go now to the questions. All right. So let's first start with Nazreen. So Nazreen, what do you consider to be some of the main pillars of Azerbaijani identity? Uh, thank you very much. First of all, I want to uh, say uh, con uh, today's uh, water, uh, the, the, the first Tuesday of uh, Novruz month. And that's why like I celebrate everyone today and we will discuss it. Uh, today as well. Um, uh, the first uh, idea that comes to the mind about the pillars of uh, Azerbaijani identity is depicted on the colors of the Azerbaijani flag. Uh, so where blue stands for Turkic identity, uh, red stands for 
belonging to modernity and uh, secularism, and green uh, stands for belonging to Muslim world. At the same time, we have to admit that each of these elements are uh, should be understood in a specific Azerbaijani uh, type of uh, interpretation of this. Because uh, yes, we are Muslim, but at the same time we celebrate uh, Zoroastrian holidays. And if you ask uh, ordinary Azerbaijani what is the main holiday of uh, Azerbaijanis in the year, it, he would not say it's Ramazan or Kurban as ordinary Muslims say, but he would say it's Novus and New Year, for example. At the same time, yes, we are secular and modern. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we also respect and uh, are maybe even sensitive about uh, our traditions, which might look a little bit conservative to an ordinary European. Uh, and at the same time, uh, this constant search between these three pillars to find the balance between these three pillars was traditionally discussed in the Azerbaijani literature. Um, one idea, like one suggestion example that I would suggest to you to find if, uh, in English um, is um, the book uh, by Jalil Mehmet Rulozadeh, the book of my mother. Uh, it depicts how uh, three sons speak three uh, types of Azerbaijani using the uh, words from Ottoman Turkish, using the words from Russian, and using the words from Persian Muslim. So like, yes, there is some kind of uh, balance. Another book is uh, the book of uh, Kurban Said, Ali Emino, uh, which is quite famous. And uh, there was even a movie uh, filmed uh, recently about this. There's constant search uh, in the head of the main character, who am I? Uh, am I uh, Turk? Uh, not really, like not totally. Uh, am I uh, European? Uh, am I, uh, because like he talks about this in the times of uh, early 20th century and he's a Russian citizen. Uh, or am I Muslim? Uh, so like there's constant, this kind of uh, search for a balance. Uh, and I think that we have reached this balance very recently. Uh, at the same time, we should also mention some specific Azerbaijani elements of identity related with uh, traditions, family relations, um, of course, music and cuisine, some different elements of culture. And um, final thing that I would like to mention is, uh, as we mentioned before, at the definition of identity, identity is quite a subjective thing, it's based indeed on stories and myths, and it has a strong element of emotions. So that whenever, um, let's say, an Azerbaijani meets a foreigner or uh, lives like maybe in the, like in the environment outside of his home, he uh, will feel uh, and, tr and will try to deliver, deliver this feeling of pride Pride for something uh, related to his history. So I, I usually observe this uh, when Azerbaijanis are living outside of, uh, of Azerbaijan. They like try to speak about like Azerbaijan is the first country in the Orient, like that had democratic republic. It gave uh, rights to women, etc. I think it's indeed it's an interesting element that. Um, as I said earlier, like this constant search for balance and at some stage, uh, uh, like we can also say we are the bridge between uh, East and West uh, so that we are, uh, and I think that we are really proud of this. Another element of course is an element of pain uh, and uh, like feeling of pain. I think we can discuss it maybe later, uh, but I just wanted to like, just to wrap it up. Um, national identity cannot be expressed with one single word. Um, there are indeed many elements, uh, and at some stage of history, some elements, uh, like there's some kind of hierarchy, some elements became more important and more valuable than others. I think that's it. Thank you, Nazreen. Uh, Garina, let's move on to you. Uh, what would you consider to be some of the main pillars of Armenian identity? 
first of all, um, I'd like to join and congratulate the um, Bright Garden Voices, the organizers for hosting this event um, and congratulate my uh, colleague as well, um, who we are having this dialogue with Nazreen. Um, and uh, thank you for everybody who's interested in um, trying to have a dialogue on, on these topics and trying to see the other side. Um, so very quickly to think about the main identity, Armenian identity, and I'd like to just preface that when I am going to speak, um, my research is how I view my lens. And so that's what I wanna um, base it on. So um, I like to look through Armenian alphabet textbooks and through education. And so um, I'm not gonna use the popular perspective, which I can you know, talk about in some of later on um, throughout the course of this discussion. But um, if I were to look at and ground the idea of what Armenian national identity is, and if I start looking at textbooks, um, it's based on a couple of things. Um, and I think Razmik Panosyan really does a nice job, job summarizing it. He says, it's late in ancient times, um, referring to religion, language, territorial basis, myths, and symbols. So um, the, there's some commonality, of course, in terms of keeping these myths um, alive and, and um, what that, and some symbols as well. But let's just take a look quickly what I, what I mean by that. Um, so for example, when we talk about religion, um, Armenia takes significant pride in being the first nation to declare Christianity as a state religion, right? And so Armenian identity is always defined by being Christian, right? First and foremost. Um, but also within the Christian religion faith, let's say we also have some elements that are paganistic or Islamic. Um, and if there's time for that, I can share a couple of examples. But um, we've our, our, what one priest told me is we've Armenianized it is what he said. Um, so religion is one, language is another, right? So regardless of which dialect you speak, um, and in our case, there's different dialects. There's the Western or branches of um, languages, what someone else might um, correct me to say, right? And so um, that doesn't really matter as long as you speak Armenian, because all Armenians must speak Armenian. Um, the next thing I would say is the, the natural and national landscapes and nature, right? So Armenia always defines itself by its borders, you know, and it's also not only borders of current time or what's within the current borders today, but it's also referring to um, historical borders and that there's always been this consistent uh, presence in this space. Um, and what I mean by that is it, it can go far back as greater Armenia to um, Western Armenia, which would be the Eastern territory of Turkey, right? And um, for some of us, that's where our ancestors from. And in my case, my family was from um, the Ottoman Empire. And so on one hand, territory was such a way to define who we are. So we refer to, um, like I said, the territories outside, which would also include, um, we could say Kharapak as well, right? And so we have territories that are both inside, outside, um, when you're in Yerevan, for example, I think those of you that have visited, you can also relate to the fact that, you know, you would see the view of Mount Ararat. And Mount Ararat is obviously not within the borders of the current Republic of Armenia, right? But for us and for somebody who, let's say you're in Armenia and you grow up there, you might hear some children think that, you know, Ararat is actually part of Armenia. And I, and I have actually seen that happen. And I wondered, you know, how did the child learn or unlearn that you know Ararat is not within the borders, but on a clear day, Ararat is so important, right? And so, um, how can you remove the cradle of civilization where Armenians, you know, were around that plateau where we where so so called we say that you know Armenians came from the high, the Armenian highland area? Um, so that's another way to think about it for the Armenian identity. Um, and then again, with nature and landscapes, is that um, it belongs to your ancestral land, right? It's your ancestry. It's related to where your grandparents are from. Um, whether you think about pop culture songs like um, Lee Tushik's recent song, um, and I know someone will laugh at it, but in reality, um, that song was really popular when I was um, there last year doing field work. Um, you know, her song, uh, which is called Pokri Kayastan or Little Armenia. Um, if you do Google it and pay attention, or if you've heard that song, it's like this talk about your we have a little home, a little Armenia, and that you should come back to Armenia, wherever you are. And it's your grandparents' um, you know, homeland. It's where your 
your grandfather um, has planted a tree there. And so it's not just identity in terms of, you know, you say you're Armenian, but it's also rooted very much so in nature, right? Um, and in the territory, in the landscapes. Um, but also we have within the Armenian national identity, you can't also discard the socialist ideals, right? Or socialist practices, socialist legacy, Soviet legacy, these are all there, of course. Um, food and family, which I know Nazin uh, talked about, um, and I briefly touched on, you know, family is, and show your ancestors, these are all very important. Um, but then over time, and, and what we, if you look at closely at Armenian history, we also have disagreement about Armenian history and how it has been written. Um, and if you think about it, most of it, if you look very closely, a lot of our sources are, you know, rely on, I would, um, in my, if I were to generalize, they rely on um, religious folks to tell us what was happening at those times. Um, so you have a very narrow perspective. And so in my dissertation research, for example, I was trying to figure out like who else existed together. Uh, we couldn't have just been alone even before borders. Uh, we were dispersed and so forth. So if you start to dig deeper, you realize the Armenian national identity was, it's based, it became homogenous over time. Um, and especially it became consolidated with the Soviet, um, the creation of the Soviet empire. And I'm not gonna go through that right now, um, but I just wanna kind of bring this broader picture and bring us back a little bit because um, I think it gives us a little bit of context about where and how we view ourselves, right? Um, and so this is just one interpretation. You can have a lot of different interpretations of it, um, whether you are part of the Armen Ivazian camp, um, you are part of the Sunni, um, Panosian, the, the different types of scholars, the different approaches. Um, but I think ultimately, you know, everybody needs to, to dig a little bit deeper when we think about um, what Armenian identity is. Um, but also I think within the histor historical context, which we'll talk, I'm, I'm gonna touch upon later is that over time, the histories of war, foreign invasions, that is what also, um, defined Armenians. So Armenians were like, hey, we're Armenian and they're not Armenian. So it became, as the title of this talk became, um, us and them. And so that's how you were able to define who Armenians were against the foreigner, against your enemy, right? Um, so I don't, I, I know I talked a whole lot um, and I apologize if I took on, but I'll definitely come back to some of these points later on. Um, and I hope that helps answer that question. Thank you, Garine. And yes, a lot of times identity seems to be in some ways sort of shaped against another, which is relevant to our next question. Uh, Aidan, let's go to you. Yes, indeed. Um, so Nazrin, uh, if you think about now, <laughs> we've heard a bit uh, from you and from Garine about uh, Azerbaijani and Armenian identity. Uh, what would you say are some of the most common misconceptions that uh, either of the sides might uh, have about the other when it comes to identity? Um, yes, I think, of course, the lack of knowledge, right, the lack of communication creates so much of misconception throughout the 30 years. Um, I will start from my observation during the war and before that. Um, Armenians, um, maybe because they are like as Garina said, um, there is a feeling like again of pride for be, being Christian, being the first country to adopt Christianity as a, a state religion. Maybe they are looking from the perspective of religion and sometimes uh, we heard, you know, this kind of rhetoric like there is a clash of civilization and, uh, you know, that uh, there is some kind of religious clashes between them. It has never been the case and uh, understanding of Azerbaijanis first like as Muslim the others I think it's a little bit exaggerated uh, because as I said earlier there are so many other uh, elements that are dominated over religious uh, identity but in general I would like to say that what is typical for both societies both Azerbaijanis and Armenians is that they know uh, very little about each other and they don't do not really understand how similar they are uh, so that uh, the fact that they have uh, 
never actually, like if we talk about younger generation, they ne have never heard anything about the opposite side, like about its culture, about its uh, traditions. Uh, they don't maybe speak the language they, uh, the opposite side speaks. They know very little about the, uh, the other, the enemy, and that creates a lot of misconceptions. Um, it was really surprising to me to learn that uh, even our languages, even the idioms, expressions, uh, they are so similar. The traditions between uh, two nations and uh, family relations, the like you know the relations between uh, parents and kids, husband and wife, and, and many many other aspects of daily life that indeed is are also should be understood as a type of identity identity element. Uh, they indeed uh, are very similar in those societies. And another aspect, I think, of course, it is caused by the conflict and uh, by the consequences of, of it. Uh, both nations know very little about the uh, history of peaceful coexistence and the examples of peaceful coexistence outside of Azerbaijan and Armenia. And I think that's the biggest problem. That's the, like that, that creates the biggest misconception that our identities are mutual incompatible as like someone said, um, it is wrong. Like, that's what I would like to say. Thanks, uh, Nazreen. And uh, if I may ask the same question to, uh, to you, Garina, what do you think would be some of the most common misconceptions uh, that either of the sides has about the other? Um, Nazreen really touched on a lot of uh, very important points. So I'm not gonna reiterate, uh, I, I agree with her points. Um, I think one, if I were to, on one hand, if I were to generalize and say, I think um, the diaspora, the perception that all Armenians, and I, and I wanna include that the diaspora in here, understand issues in Armenia or understand where Arapah is and what, what all these, what, what, what is going on. I think that the, from the Azerbaijani side, I imagine they think that, we, that we're all on the same page or that we all understand it. Um, and there are people who, who don't. Um, there are Armenians that grow up that don't know Armenian, that don't speak Armenian. There are, and we criticize each other within our own community. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that we ourselves fight about on one hand. So we're not all the same. Um, and I think that's one, it's a unique thing as well. We're not going to be the same. But at the same time, I think every, I think an Azerbaijani probably thinks we're all the same, that we all, we all have the same views. Um, I think in terms of that, the generation that, and I, and I'm, I just, I think I may, might need to give a preface that um, I'm born and raised in the United States, right? And so um, I never lived in Armenia. And so that adds a different layer and how um, I view this, the conflict and how I've ex experienced learning to be Armenian and the misconception about um, the past in terms of coexistence. Um, when I was doing field work recently in Armenia, um, and I was asking certain questions, um, it was like, well, why are you asking these questions? Why, well, for some people, right? It's like, well, why do you want to go visit this grave site, graveyard site, which um, like, you know, who sent you here? And the reason why I, I saw this grave site, uh, I thought, okay, this must be Islamic um, symbols. I wanted to go see it and I'm asking questions about it. And so, um, it was a bus ride on my way to this to this area, and the teachers were like, "Yeah, we you can go visit it. That's no problem." Um, and they realized soon realized that I couldn't, um, but the Armenian could, right? Like the local Armenian could visit that site, but I couldn't. Um, and so for me, it was I understood that uh, you know I don't belong here, that I'm not even from Armenia, and I can't ask these questions. Um, but also, I, what I why I want to bring up the grave site is because. When I did did dig, de, uh, excuse me, dig deeper into the study, you know, I started to realize that just as much as you know, on one side the Azerbaijanis wanted to come visit the graves and ask the Armenians there, please, you know, take care of these tombstones and so forth. Um, it, there was a promise. There was promises to each other, and so the the Azerbaijanis said the same to them. And so um, I can understand why, on one hand, that village was surprised by me because they must have thought I was working for somebody or whatever. Um, but, it, uh, you know, there is this, this, 
mutual understanding of that, you know, we both value family and we both, you know, wish that we could see each other's or visit each other's grave sites that, you know, existed. And so, um, I mean, I, I don't have anything more to add to Nazine's, but these kinds of unique stories that aren't told because we're the generations that um, didn't live the histories of coexistence and that these things did exist, that we did live by each other. Um, and asking those questions has become treacherous or problematic. And so I think later on, if there's time, we can touch on that as well. Thank you very much. Great. Now let's go to Nazreen again. Nazreen, what role do you think the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict has played in shaping the identity of post-Soviet Azerbaijan? Yes, thank you. Uh, well, recently I found uh, there was a report of international report International alert, I'm sorry. Uh, it's mentioned, by the way, that Nagorno-Karabakh conflict is an uh, important element of identity, both for Azerbaijan and Armenia. Indeed, it's shaped a lot of uh, elements of our self-perception. Uh, if we start from, like, from the very first years, uh, we should recognize that uh, Nagorno-Karabakh conflict uh, became a catalyst in the process of national movement for independence. Uh, if we look at the er early 1990s or late 1980s, it was the period indeed that uh, the rise of the conflict uh, raised the question of, uh, is the Soviet Union really trustable? And is this ideology that we believed in, uh, is it real? Isn't it just an illusion? All of this, you know, ideas that we were fed with, you know, like there is a, a brotherhood, of, uh, brotherhood of nations and like that uh, we all Soviet people. So to, to a big extent, of course, Nagorno-Karabakh conflict because it became a catalyst in the formation of Azerbaijani post-Soviet identity, independent identity. But the outcome, and I think like, again, uh, of course it also, that was what happened in Armenia as well, because it also became independent uh, because of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, we can say. But what was different for the Azerbaijani side was of course the outcome uh, of the first war. And uh, the outcome was, uh, catastrophic, absolutely, very tragic. Uh, as a child, like as a kid of 1990s, uh, so when I went to school, I remember this, like from the, um, the very first years, like it was everywhere. It was surrounding us uh, in, on the streets, in the center of Baku, there were dormitories that were given to the refugees. Uh, because the number of refugees and IDPs was uh, extremely high for a small population. Um, and economy was still very weak so that we could not, uh, like the state could not provide relevant help to them. Uh, of course, there were also, uh, you know, a lot of stories and uh, images, uh, footages that we were uh, shown on TV, uh, Chinggis Mustafaev videos and so on, they have uh, left a huge trauma on the Azerbaijani society. Um, but at the same time, I would like to say that, you know, apart from the feeling of pain, as uh, I just mentioned in the first uh, question when we were saying that indeed uh, identities are shaped by emotions. So like pride and pain, are you know, like also like they are catalysts that uh, define some elements of identity. And indeed there was a huge pain and there was a huge uh, violation of the feeling of pride to some extent because uh, we were feeling humiliated. We were feeling uh, the loss in the, like defeated of course. And at the same time, uh, the value of the region uh, Nagorno-Karabakh in particular, Shusha, it was so huge and so painful uh, that people really could not understand why did that happen? Why did that have to happen? Um, 
I think uh, that was why uh, indeed for third, like despite 30 years passed since the first war, it was still so painful uh, because like, again, we, we face the stories uh, of refugees and what they face there. Uh, and at the same time, because uh, it was a feeling that we have lost something really important. Um, I think that it can be added to the list of misconceptions um, about how uh, both Armenians and Azerbaijanis did not understand how valuable Nagorno-Karabakh is for the opposite side. I can say that Armenians did not understand that uh, for Azerbaijanis it's not just a territory. Sometimes I saw you know, some comments in uh, social media uh, saying that for Azerbaijanis it's just a piece of territory, for us it's uh, our soul. No, it's also our soul. Uh, I've seen it so many times I've heard this that people compare it like uh, uh, there's a phrase from a famous Azerbaijani uh, poetry referring to Shusha so that like can we really separate a soul from a heart and um, it was a like feeling of emotion that uh, shaped our identity uh, and I think that the the, the second, the outcome of the second war, uh, of course, it also left another trauma, the trauma like when we observed the territories and the cities that were totally destroyed and uh, without any single building left untouched. Of course, it's another shock, but uh, I think that it can be overcome because like maybe People now feel that yes, this this pain is uh, partially healed. Why I'm using like why I referring to this and I talk to about this because I think that um, I do understand that Armenians feel something very similar right now after the loss and the like defeat in the second world in the second war, but um, I think that maybe you know like what is important for us to as to societies is empathy, is understanding of the pain because we both have passed through this same experience, painful experience. And maybe now after the second war, it could be, I don't know, I, I do understand that emotions are still very high, but maybe the experience we have as two nations have passed through, maybe it can help us uh, look into the reality and understand that we have to stop it, just to make it the last war. Thank you, Nazreen. All right, uh, the next question is to Garina. Um, so you mentioned that you grew up uh, in the Armenian diaspora, of course, so uh, that's why the question is more to speak about your personal experience, um, thinking of the First Karabakh War, how has that affected you growing up uh, in the Armenian diaspora? What, what kind of memories do you have about that? Could you share a bit? Um, thank you. I think there are a couple of things that I think that do need to be clarified um, because I think I heard in Nezreen's response that the Karabakh conflict or Karabakh um, was always central to the Armenian identity. Um, I do want to start by saying I don't I don't agree with that. Um, and actually, there was a talk yesterday with uh, Vikan Chaterian and Amin, Amin uh, Mili, um, and and Vikan does touch upon that very much. So there's a lot of scholars also that do touch on this. If you do look at the so, as I was talking about the historical context of the national identity in my first answer, um, you know the con the idea of Gharapov wasn't central to the national identity. Um, in fact, if you, there was issues about it, right? Um, for Armenians, it was perceived as um, why did this territory, um, why was it given to the Soviet Union? So there's this like, um, miss, like this, uh, uh, up, like that they, they were upset that they didn't, that this territory was not part of um, Armenia when the borders were drawn, right? And so um, during Soviet time, there is coexistence. And I think to this question, more so than me and Nazreen to answer, I think the Gharapakh community should be addressing that question about the national identity. Because I think that their, their 
they can speak more to that, right? And so, because they lived with each other, Gharapakh, they are, that's their national identity. Um, so in that context, I think that needs to be clarified as well. Um, you also have to think about the 70 years or so of the Soviet Union. And that's something that as a, as a child, um, just also I'll weave that my answer in about my childhood. You know, when you grew up in the diaspora, at least in my case, um, we just knew that there was an Armenia, but we didn't know what, where it was. Um, Soviet was bad, especially for the Dashnaks, it was so bad, right? And I'm not gonna go into that, to that context of that history, but you don't have in, when you look at the alphabet textbooks in my case, when you look at the way we talk about homeland, especially during the Soviet Union, it's not drawn by borders, right? It's not, um, you're all brothers and sisters, right? And so the Soviet Union, um, did, and some might say, led us to misbelieve or disbelieve, however you want to say it, doesn't matter. We do have to acknowledge that during the Soviet Union, it was so easy to, for an Armenian from Yerevan to go to a uh, vacation in Baku. Uh, there was a huge Armenian community in Baku. There was a huge Armenian, uh, excuse me, huge Azerbaijani community um, in Yerevan and across the border villages um, in Armenia that I personally got to, to see. Um, so you, do, you did have 70 years of a, whole, a shared identity in that case, right? Um, you have the rise of um, 1980s and nationalism and we can blame again, blame or not blame. I don't wanna give opinions about like uh, what the Soviet Union did, but the Soviet Union, right? Like they did, um, I, and I think this is important to contextualize when we talk about identity. The Soviet Union does um, encourage the nation states to become to use their national identity, right? Use their national language, um, national language policies. And so you do have a rise of nationalism, right? And in some cases it became more on the, per like for periphery countries. Um, and maybe it did become greater in the context of Armenia. I'm not, I can't say for sure for fact, but these are very important to think about, right? And so all of a sudden you have a shift that happens and then you have, um, but also you have what the Armenians were saying from what I grew up hearing as a child was that um, Armenians in Gharapakh that grew up there and, and, and that lived there. And again, it's not just Armenians that lived in Gharapakh, right? There was a bunch of different types of communities in Gharapakh, but for the Armenians there, they were, um, and this is what I learned, that they were being discriminated against, that their rights were not being valued, um, that they didn't have human rights there. Um, and that this is something that they brought to the attention of the Soviet Union before, after so forth. And so, for me, it was this understanding of um, an injustice to them. And so that's why their pursuit for self-determination, um, I, under I understood it on one hand. Um, but again, I, I wonder if we had this conversation and brought people from the Gharapakh community because for far too long, um, this dialogue has been an Ar Armenian and Azerbaijani pitted against each other. And in reality, the community that is not being brought into this conversation is those people um, there, right? And so um, I guess I'll stop here, but I, I just, I think it's important to clarify the differences. The talk that I was referring to was the great debate that um, happened yesterday. I could share the link um, later on afterwards if anyone's interested or other sources too. Thanks, Gary. Now. Thank you. Uh, so now let's go to Nazreen again. Nazreen, how does a school curriculum shape and promote ideas of the nation, patriotism, and the enemy in Azerbaijan? Um, well, I can speak in general um, about, again, the research is made by different experts uh, in this particular issue. I remember there was held a, uh, the search by uh, a number of uh, experts uh, and this publication was made in 2008 in the Czech Republic. Uh, I can also share a link later. Um, it's called um, Contemporary History Textbooks in the South Caucasus, where they compared the level of uh, inclusivity and the, the language used uh, about national minorities and about uh, the, the neighbors and current uh, opposite sides in the conflict. 
And it showed that the situation in, in Georgia is much better than in the other two republics of the South Caucasus. Um, another research was also like, uh, I, I remember, uh, reminds me that in early 2000s, um, there was an effort uh, held by the, sponsored by the European Union uh, on writing a common history textbook for uh, the whole region, again, for the South Caucasus. And uh, the historians from Armenia and Azerbaijan, they could not agree uh, like when they reached the early 20th century. So the problem, of course, it's at, at the very basis of uh, different interpretations of history. Moreover, I will tell you, it's not only uh, this problem of the post-Soviet uh, situation, but even during the Soviet times at the early 1980s, uh, when historians from uh, both Armenia and Azerbaijan were invited to Moscow to uh, prepare and uh, write the historical maps of the medieval ages. They, they, they also did disagreed and this project was canceled. So the, the problem here, unfortunately, is that Again, I don't want to blame the Soviet Union, but indeed, starting from 1960s and 1970s, there was a process of the formation of nationalism in both republics. And uh, unfortunately, the studies of history, uh, interpretations of history, uh, even during the, like, like the history about uh, Middle Ages, like something unrelated to the modern times, um, they were shaped differently in two republics. So that to some extent it started long before the conflict, unfortunately. And after the conflict, after the 1990s, uh, it just simply exploded. Uh, now, when we think about uh, in a broader understanding, uh, it's not only about the books, uh, the textbooks and the curriculum. I can say that it, it is general, of course, it's the language, the language of the conflict, um, language that is surrounding us uh, everywhere. It's not only at schools, it's also uh, in the media, uh, in the elements of culture, like popular music, movies, uh, literature, etc. Especially when it uh, comes to something like very recent history, something that Relate, like is it related to us, our neighbors, people who know or like whom we know. Uh, and I would also like to stress that, that there is also an element of uh, myths, you know, and some kind of rumors sometimes that exist uh, again, like in both communities, like in both uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia, uh, that we see that there are again some myths about the conflict that have, the, they are not mentioned in the textbooks, but everyone knows about them. Uh, that's why I think like it's, it's important to also keep in mind that it's a language of conflict in a broader understanding. Uh, maybe I would advise you to hold one meeting about this topic in particular, because it can be discussed really for hours. At the same time, I have a counter argument uh, about the, issue of curriculum. Why? Because when I think about the Soviet experience, uh, when we come back to the first part, like the first half of the like, Soviet period, uh, namely 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, it was the period of very strict Stalinism, very, you know, like totalitarian regime under which speaking about any kind of nationalism uh, was absolutely prohibited. Uh, and of course, the textbooks of those times were very different. And nevertheless, um, both uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia kept to some extent uh, the narrative of the, of the pre-Soviet conflict. So that I wouldn't say that, yes, it was not, of course, uh, that strong because the propaganda was against it. And, language of the relations was totally different. But nevertheless, uh, I would say that just as a counter argument that when I think that uh, if there was a different uh, textbooks and language that we had 
in the 1990s, in 2000s, uh, and later in Azerbaijani textbooks, uh, history textbooks, um, would it have changed our attitude to the conflict? Yes and no, because uh, still the memory of the conflict, because again, I want to remind that uh, this is a relatively small society where people know each other, where people like to talk and share, uh, they experience emotions. And there is, of course, a big uh, element of rumors and myths maybe, but still they exist. And my question is to, to what extent curriculum really defines the attitude, really defines the image of enemy. Uh, maybe Gary and I can help. Thank you, Nazreen. Um, Guyane, I want to ask you the same question. How does school curriculum uh, shape and promote ideas of the nation, patriotism, and the enemy in Armenia? Um, so this is an area that I've spent a whole lot of time on, and um, I think you've heard some of my um, ideas before. Um, if there's time later, I can share some textbook examples, actually, of images. Um, but basically, the images of nation and um, patriotism, I would let, I mean, for example, if we start with nation, the national, the way I described the national identity a little bit earlier, um, the notion of the territory, um, you know, your homeland, being proud of your homeland. And again, it, it does go from Soviet to post-Soviet of proud to be Armenian, proud to be part of the Soviet Union. Um, so those ideas are definitely infused with the nature and landscapes um, territory. Um, you can, again, even today, we'll see pictures of even um, Erebuni. And so there's a lesson on the letter B and you fill it into Erebuni. And Erebuni is like an old, um, one of the old ancient uh, Armenians, like the capitals. And so you have, but it's not the capital today. Do you know what I mean? So there's this continuous presence of the same area over time, but still going back and forth, right? Um, you also have pictures of Van, and Van is an old city in the Ottoman Empire, one of the provinces where Armenians lived, right? And so there's all of these types of images that are infused much more in the post-Soviet textbooks. Um, but coming to this idea of the enemy, um, we, in terms of Armenian textbooks, this, this concept is not in it. The, our, the Gharapakh conflict comes up around in the ninth grade and the 12th grade. It depends on a couple of the different textbooks, but like Barhu Daryan, for example, one of the authors, you'll see him talk uh, to, he's one of the, you have, and that's something I wanna talk about as well, like who are these curriculum writers? And so they're definitely born in Soviet time. Um, they're definitely continuing to preach and create that same paradigm and ideology and breaking from that would imply that um, you are becoming treacherous or trying to step away from that. The, the historians have always been trained to continue the same um, ideological approach. And some of it, as Nezin says, does keep some of that Soviet ideology even included in there. Um, but you have to look for that. In terms of enemy though, it's not filled with from um, analyses that are done not, not only by me, but also from many other scholars. So uh, Mikhail Zol Zoloyan has an entire chapter in the 2012 um, Armenian Azerbaijani uh, textbook analysis where they do look at these um, images and so forth. Um, and you know, as Zoloyan finds in his studies, there's nothing filled with like, we hate, like hate people and this and this. It's just understood that, you know, an Azerbaijani is an enemy, right? And that's that's the extent of it. It doesn't go into hateful language. And when you do go into the classroom, which is something I've done as well in Armenia in different um, spaces, um, there's no hateful language in that sense either. How is it being discussed after in popular opinion? You have different ranges, of course, but the curriculum is not emphasizing um, this, like, uh, or infusing hate. Um, it's more of, we understand them as enemy and that's where the us and them comes in, right? So. Um, that's just a very quick touch on in terms of um, how curriculum does talk about it. The, the other thing in terms of Kharapath, like um, in the 2003 alphabet textbook, I saw, for example, um, the territory 
was attached to the Sunnic region. Um, so all of the other regions in Armenia are shaded different colors. Bagharapakh was attached to Sunnic and it was green. And the text underneath it said Mir Haidanik. And it's this text about like our borders are strong, our far fatherland. And it doesn't specify specifically the conflict. It doesn't talk about Karapakh separating it or anything. It's it's not a it, it's not this like um, it's it's just understood as you know being together is as how they're describing it. Um, whether it's correct or not, I'm not having that dialogue right now, but I'm just trying to share with you in terms of how our Creek, at least in Armenia, and a lot of the textbooks, by the way, are also shared to diaspora and Armenian communities. So if you do go to some of these Armenian schools, you know, we do share a lot of material with each other. You don't, um, some schools don't, some schools create their own curriculum. It depends where you go to school. Um, but I would say there, it, it, the messages are not full of hate in, in our context, I would say. Thank you, Garina. All right, um, in that case, we have our next question. And Nazrin, I'll uh, ask you first. How do you think um, the perception of political and historical uh, borders of um, Azerbaijan is actually influencing Azerbaijani identity? Yes, um, as Garina earlier mentioned, indeed, territory is an important element of identity because territory is not only about a piece of land, it's also, of course, about uh, history it is related to. It can be related to symbols, it can be related to the monuments that are uh, located on that territory. So it's also about uh, even, you know, again, graves of people uh, who, who cannot access to that territory. In that uh, sense, we should understand that territory is an important element. When talking about historical uh, borders, what is actually again uniting both Azerbaijanis and Armenians is that both Azerbaijanis and Armenians are divided nations. Uh, the historical borders do not uh, do not uh, they are not the same as the current political borders. Uh, moreover, if we look at the you know like at the hist like at the map. Uh, we can see that uh, Armenians were living from west to east, while Azerbaijanis were living from north to the south. And uh, actually, the historical centers uh, of and cultural centers, we can say, of the Azerbaijani civilization was uh, located actually in Tabriz. Similarly, for Armenia, we can say that the center of the historical center of Armenians was Van. Not like so. To some extent, we can say that uh, current political borders, uh, to some extent, they are shaped at the outskirts of the historical, uh, you know, area of location. Um, at the same time, uh, when we think about, uh, like, yes, in eighteen twenty-eight, uh, Azerbaijan was divided and. Uh, the, that part uh, of population who or was and still is living in Iran, they developed in a different way and uh, Azerbaijan developed in a different. Uh, but when we look further, even like today to the north and to the west uh, and in the past to the like uh, southwest, uh, Azerbaijanis are and were uh, populating territories outside of the political borders. Um, I can say that, yes, um, as a uh, outcome of this colonial legacy, because of these historical borders do not uh, overlap with, uh, with the political borders, there is some element uh, in the society. There are people who might think that it is unfair, that uh, borders should be changed, uh, something that is called irredentism, but um, it is important to mention that uh, intelligentsia, first of all, it, it can play a very important role uh, in uh, dissuading, let's say, uh, elements, uh, opinions like this. Uh, 
Uh, one example was when in the late 1980s, uh, Azerbaijanis of Magnolia living in Georgia uh, raised this movement. They uh, talked about, you know, like they protested uh, and asked for unification with Azerbaijan. As a reaction immediately, Azerbaijani intelligentsia representatives, they went to the villages and they asked those people to stop and never to raise that question again. Since then, Azerbaijanis of Manuli can be called maybe the, one of the most devoted uh, group, ethnic group uh, in Georgia. Uh, now, when we talk about uh, political borders, yes, it is true that uh, political borders are, uh, can be seen from coins and banknotes to, uh, of course, all of uh, the uh, institutions. And it was never shown in, a, in the way that uh, part of Nagorno-Karabakh, which was occupied, uh, that it, it, it was outside. It was always presented in, in terms of the territorial integrity. Uh, yes, it is, of course, an element of uh, political uh, line, we can say, but at the same time, again, uh, going back to the like, feelings, uh, I want to mention that um, maybe because uh, both Azerbaijanis and Armenians are actually divided nations, maybe it uh, shapes the attitude, uh, the absolute intransigence to any kind of compromise. And the fact that uh, Nagorno-Karabakh was something more than just a territory, it's you know, just um, something that is related to the, uh, to the people who made, uh, as it shaped Azerbaijani culture to a big extent. Uh, this is why it was always remembered. Uh, again, I will leave aside, you know, all the discussions on that uh, international law or international co community supports territorial integrity or, or vice versa. Uh, we are not here to discuss this issue, but what I want to say that, yes, uh, political borders uh, have been a very important element to some extent, an element of identity as well, because it was as an image, it was shaped, it was uh, presented um, in, in many uh, sources of information. Uh, again, as I said, starting from banknotes uh, to billboards on, on the streets to everywhere. Like it is to some extent a, a element that was shaped in our subconsciousness. Thank you, Nazrin. Um... So I'll ask the same question to you, Garina, uh, and I know this is more in your area of expertise as well. Um, so how does the perception of the borders of Armenia, uh, political or historical borders, um, influence the Armenian identity? Um, so I'm only going to answer the question towards the Armenian context because um, that's my focus. Um, but in terms of how borders define identity, that's exactly it, right? And so over and the historical context that I brought up earlier, um, it gives us an understanding of foreign invasions. It's always about how territory has been uh, redefined, reshaped, um, even to this moment, we're having a, a crisis, right? Of how do we define identities at this point? Um, whether it's about the territories that are going back and forth um, with the Gharapakh territory right now, whether we're talking about some of the territory in Armenia, this is how we shape identity, right? Um, these political and historical conflicts that are not resolved um, constantly infuse, inform, and shape who, how an Armenian sees themselves. Um, and again, there's a lot of different historians' versions. Um, I'm not going to go through all of their approaches. Everybody has a different approach. Um, ultimately, I think we don't have enough information uh, in terms of being able to be conclusive and say that this history is correct fully or, and this isn't. Um, we, we do have narratives of people. And I think that we need to be able to repiece some of this to understand the identity better. Um, and that might mean you need to take out some of the nationalism, right? And so 
in my case, in my research, I take a decolonial approach, which means taking away the, col the colonial settler um, and so forth, those approaches and to understand how do we unlearn what, we, what we've learned. Um, and in my case, when I started to unpack um, how maps and how Armenia defined itself from beginning of time to now, it makes me understand that the Armenian identity was never ever a homogenous identity in the, in the beginnings. It changed over time based on how wars and foreign invasions, we're talking about Seljuk, um, the Seljuks, Ottoman Empire, Persian Empire, all of these things shaped us, right? And so you, that's why you do see some of the influences. If we say an evil eye, we all can agree, right? Because we all um, lived, we have the region that is, we have these influences in our identity. So um, is it a good thing or a bad thing? That's not the point of the, the, the yeah, this question, but I do think that if we put it into context, um, that's how we're able to see what the identity is, how we're portraying it today, the homogenous identity. It is a bit troubling to try to say all our means are the same and that we're all Christian and that we're all um, the same type of uh, practices. I can't even um, like go into the in-depth like way that we try to say that we're all the same. We're not, right? Um, you do have Yazdis. And so they have to conform to the Armenian identity. You have people that are not from Armenia, but they do read and study the same textbooks. And so they have to conform to the Armenian identity. Straying away from that is problematic in some cases because you're not Armenian enough, right? And then the community starts to judge you. Um, so I think that we could talk a lot, a, a lot about this, but I think it's always important to contextualize uh, when we're, we're trying to answer the, these types of questions. Thanks. Thanks a lot for that. So Nazreen, let's go back to you for the next question. What, and I know you have written about this topic and it's a very interesting um, topic to discuss. What role can a sense of a regional identity play in the conflict resolution? And we're talking about Armenia, Azerbaijan, Nagorno-Karabakh and how can such an identity be cultivated and developed? Yes, this is indeed a very interesting topic. Uh, might be sound quite controversial and utopian right now. People might not believe that it's even possible. I'll try to uh, explain. Uh, first of all, uh, we should understand that a sense of regional identity uh, and its role in the conflict resolution, it can become a glue as the, like the final destination for the uh, conflict resolution to make a stable peace and like make it long lasting. That's, that's number one, or what is important to remember. It is true that there are not that many examples in the world. Uh, the first thing that comes to our mind is uh, the European Union. Uh, it is indeed a, a role model for every region in which uh, nations that used to be enemies, that used to fight against each other, they are now living under the same roof and they recognize themselves as Europeans. Uh, yes, it is true that national identity uh, will still dominate. It doesn't make that regional identity will become more important. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the feeling of, uh, we feeling it's called, like the feeling of uh, shared uh, or common identity, it really helps uh, keep uh, the region united. Uh, it's the, uh, the one of the important factors for integration, uh, for long lasting integration. And uh, if we, the, think about how it can be cultivated and developed. Uh, well, it's a very long road. And uh, once again, I do understand that right now for the South Caucasus, it looks like unimaginable. Uh, but uh, if we read the history, you know, of, uh, in the early 20th century, uh, when uh, European philosophers and uh, thinkers, they, they talked about like, like someday it will be the, the solution because when you have a system in which borders do not matter, 
there are, like borders do not exist and people can travel easily. Um, and there is common understanding of history because they have you know, common history textbooks and so many other factors. And uh, in this case, of course, it, it doesn't even matter uh, to whom this or that territory belongs to. Now, how it can be cultivated? It, it requires, of course, a huge, uh, huge efforts, both at the level of uh, political leadership and at the level of uh, social interaction. Um, I figured for myself some kind of a formula uh, for political elites, there should be a strategic vision. Uh, there should be understanding that uh, becoming friends with your enemy can actually uh, be very advantageous for both of you. Uh, for that, uh, usually uh, in history, there exist common interests between the societies or common threat. By the way, common threat is also an important factor uh, uh, that can help in uh, shaping of such uh, like first rapprochement and cooperation, integration and regional identity. Uh, so uh, it, by the way, like when we talk about uh, common threat, it's not necessarily a threat of external power. It's also be a, a threat in the broader understanding when we talk about economic, environmental th threat. Uh, we can even think about in, in the context of uh, the South Caucasus, the nuclear threat of Metsamor atomic station and, and so many other examples that can come to our mind. Um, and uh, another point is that uh, common interest is that uh, when elites do understand that cooperation can in fact be very advantageous for the economies, uh, for, for the political strength of the region. Uh, and why? Because again, like uh, when we think about the region, in particular South Caucasus, it's uh, such a complicated uh, place in terms of ethnicities, like in terms of national minorities that inhabit. And uh, the, the best way indeed is the, 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 the system in which uh, each minority will be respected and uh, there will be some kind of confederation. Again, if we think about in the context of uh, Azerbaijani-Georgian relations or in the future Azerbaijani-Armenian relations when uh, nationalities are living on both sides of the border, uh, like Currently, we can speak about uh, Azerbaijanis and Georgians or Armenians and Georgians, uh, although Georgians are not that much, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in Armenia. But anyway, like the factor when there is no uh, borders, it really isn't uh, the, the life of, uh, of the societies. Uh, another factor when we come to the when, when we go from political elites to the societies per se, what is important is the reconstruction of trust, first of all, like what we think about uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia. What is lacking is trust. Uh, we are living in a situation where uh, neither Azerbaijanis go to, can, can go to Armenia or Armenians can, can come to Azerbaijan because they, they are afraid, of course. They are afraid yeah. of the reaction of the society and how people perceive each other. Uh, so, in fact, this trust can be uh, like as in human relations, we should understand that trust is built for years and decades and it can be destroyed within an hour and a day. And unfortunately, in case of Azerbaijan-Armenian relations, uh, yes, trust is, uh, is, right now it's destroyed, it's not there, but um, initiatives like, like yours guys, by the way, and initiatives like um, like building communication, uh, building channels, building platforms on which uh, people, especially younger generation, people who do not know each other, if they can talk to each other, if they can listen to each other, understand each other, it can be a, maybe a first step. Uh, reading about the history and culture of each other, uh, reading more, you know, literature, movies, etc just as well what we were talking today, like 
to understand the culture of your enemy, uh, to work on the you know rehumanization because like there was a process of dehumanization of the opposite side. So that we we need to think about how to rehumanize each other, how to understand each other's pain. Uh, of course, it will take a longer time, but it is possible. Um, some experts, like they call it, like there needs to be a transformation of societies in terms of liberalization of minds. Like when, when we really start to think about, uh, like when we can overcome this nationalism. Uh, yes, it is true that uh, it is a long process. Uh, it is also, you know, takes two to tango and we should understand that when the first side can send like, you know, some message uh, like, takes the first step, uh, there should be come, like, we should see the, another step from the opposite side. We should also understand that there is a huge pain again on both sides of the border and people do have a lot of negative memories, of course, especially when we talk like you know, this week is a very sensitive week and we have a very like, very tragic like memory of tragic events. Uh, I do understand that it is hard to expect expect from the opposite side uh, to apologize, but at least recognition of this past, recognition of the pain of the opposite side, it can really help. It can be really a very helpful tool. Uh, so again, there are so many aspects and they have to be presented in a comprehensive way. There is a good book by uh, Anna Ohanyan. Uh, she wrote a book about particular on this topic. It's called Networked uh, Regionalism as a Conflict Management. And uh, she talked about, um, she compared the cases of Western Balkans and, um, and South Caucasus. And uh, while Western Bal Balkans is also a region that passed through such a tragic uh, series of events in the 1990s, they have hope, let's say, because first, because um, they have common interests. They do understand that if they cooperate, uh, you know, to some extent, there's some carrot of joining the European Union. And they do understand that they have to overcome. And when they think, like even there, is, there was a phrase in her book uh, from one of the respondents who said that uh, if we knew that it would uh, like that sooner or later there will be no borders, uh, then the, why did that war have to happen? You know, the, why, why did we have to give so, so many lives of uh, young boys? Uh, like, what, was it really, like maybe it was, it was meaningless. So, you know, like um, in Western Balkans, um, it is a relatively successful example. Of course, there are examples of, um, uh, regions where it already happened. Uh, once again, uh, it's the, the the role model. We can say the example of uh, relations between France and Germany. Let's not forget that they passed through two world wars, uh, and there have been so many casualties and so many victims until they have reached this understanding. There is also example of uh, German-Polish relations, uh, Hungarian-Romanian relations, and many others. Um, yes, maybe I will stop here. I, I'm speaking too, too long. Thank you, Nazreen. That was very informative. I done. Yes, so um, uh, addressing to you, Garina, the next question is uh, more about how do you see uh, there currently being a sense of uh, regional identity in the South Caucasus? Like, is it is it there at all? And um, if if you know um, if we're talking about it, then is there such a will toward a, a more integrated sense of identity in this region? I think it's a really good question, um, and I and I'll I'll speak to from the my experiences of both living there between 2013 and 2017, my experiences of traveling there several times. Um, and in general, uh, from a diasporan perspective as well. Um, first of all, I am i don't see a sense of regional identity or I've never experienced it myself. I don't feel that. Um, I don't think that, and I'm not trying to be pessimistic, but I'm just trying to, to speak to the current reality. So um, you have, 
a lot of divisions. And until the nation state concept, which this is currently the, where we are living, right? We are living in a nation state world, um, removing borders and living utopian and rec living regionally is, is not happening anytime soon, as far as I can see or understand. Now, was it possible earlier where you had the Transcaucasian Federation? Yeah, absolutely. That was possible before the Soviet Union was formed, right? And so you had Armenians, Georgians, Azerbaijanis. It, there was a region. We actually had something there. Um, was that the right way to go? I'm not sure, but that definitely was the only time that I can foresee that we actually had a regional um, identity. Um, and moving forward, I don't think until we address these issues from either side of the borders, uh, be it from the Gharapakh side of their borders, from the um, Azerbaijani side of your borders, from the Armenian side of their borders, you know, until we don't address these issues, regional identity is so utopian, in my opinion. It's, it's, it's not going to visit each other while wow, that's so utopian and nice to see. Um, I can say, for example, if you visit my um, gallery later on, there's a picture, because I went to one museum in Gumri, and um, the museum curator she was just kind of walking me around the back, back area. And um, there was a whole bunch of, and he was, on, he was installing new installations there. And there was a wall of all these bottles of wine. And I was like, what is this wall? And it was all covered in dust. And I was like, wow, what a shame. You know, you have all this wine and so forth. And we're just kind of having a conversation. He said, these are all of the regional projects we've had to try to bring us together. And it was um, Armenians from, from Armenia, from, uh, there was people from the Ottoman, uh, not, excuse me, the um, Eastern Turkey. You had people from Georgia, you had people from Gars, uh, excuse me, yeah, Gars was also in, included from Turkey. You had people from Azerbaijan. So there was all of these projects over these last, I don't know how many years. And unfortunately, even those of us that identify with the peace uh, building movement, we failed. Ultimately, we failed. Not only did we fail, the scholars failed. Um, I agree that you know some of the points Chaitanya just said yesterday. We've all failed. So the question of having a regional identity, um, it definitely involves much. It, we need to be able to speak more openly. Um, some might call this radical, but I'm sorry if we don't begin to have these kinds of conversations, you're not going to be able to. I mean, there's it's not going to happen. Having peaceful relations is is not. And what does peace mean? That's something that I'm constantly when I'm listening to these experts talk, um, they don't define peace. They don't, under, they don't describe what it means. So for peace for someone who is an Armenian from Gharapakh is very different than what peace means to an Armenian in Yerevan, what it means. And sometimes there's of course overlap. Sure, there might be, um, I'm not saying there isn't, but how we even view peace is also extremely different, right? And so, um, there's still a lot more to do, but in terms of right now, in this moment, until these issues are not addressed, you have um, the prisoners of war that as was brought up in the beginning of the talk, you have um, IGPs, you have, there's, I, I can't, and I'm not trying to be pessimistic, I assure you, I've been involved in um, cross-border projects for um, like at least 10, at least 10 years, if not more. Um, and yes, we've come together, um, Armenians, Azerbaijanis met each other. And again, Gharapakh sees, or finding people from Karapakh is always very hard to find because again, this, com this conflict has been pitted against Armenians and Azerbaijanis, but in reality, there's a voice that's been missing this entire time. Um, so I think this is really, these are key things to, to think about that, you know, what, what has gone wrong? What, what have we not accomplished? How do we move forward? Um, I think it relies on us. Um, I mean, I, I don't know, I was just really inspired by Chetirian's, uh, I finally felt like I heard somebody say something to speak to the current moment rather than these utopian ideas, which they're beautiful, they're wonderful, but how do we achieve it? And um, we need to be very, we need to be more realistic and concrete as he was saying. All right, I think that's, uh, that was our last uh, question. Yes, uh, thank you both and also the co-hosts for this part. Um, now we go to the final part of the meeting, which is the, so to say, open discussion where participants can send me questions or write me on, on private if they want to um, ask something or say something and I'll in order give them the space. So actually um, I will invite Knarik uh, to share what, um, because, um, I'm sorry, he, I guess, it's from 
Artsakh, and he said, I'm from Karabakh, and he, he said he wanted to share like uh, an opinion, she, sorry, <laughs> about um, Artsakhi national identity. So I will invite you, Narik, to put your camera, microphone, if you are there. Yes, I'm here. I am a she. <laughs> Hi, sorry. <laughs> no worries. It's always funny when uh, people try to guess who I am. Hi. Hi. Um, first of all, um, thank you for a wonderful discussion. Um, it was very interesting. It's my first time uh, participating in this. And uh, yeah, I'm a bit nervous to be speaking right now. I didn't plan on it. But uh, when uh, Karina said uh, that it wasn't her place um, to talk about the uh, national identity of people from Artsakh, I thought maybe I could share my perspective. Again, a private one, opinion, you know, I can talk only about myself, like the disclaimer in the beginning of your video, I represent myself. <laughs> Having said that, um, I think, um, it's um it's a bit hard to talk about that but <clears throat> the national identity i grew up with first of all i am from Artsakh. i was uh, born in stepanakert in 1993 um and uh, yeah lived there um went to school the university um, my whole family is there um the national identity i grew up with has been um has been it, it's it always felt unfair um just um like a big mistake happened and that's why we're in this situation and that mistake was of course because we were put in in during the soviet soviet times in the borders that we've been put and it's been um we've always been aware um of that, um, there I haven't obviously lived through the through the part where um, you know there was coexistence um, since I was born after the war, but um, my entire family did, and so they have told me you know many stories. Um, my mom's cousin was married to an Azerbaijani man, and they live in Bakuna. We've lost touch with them, you know, with throughout the war, we're connected recently. Um, but we've had our own distinct identity. We speak our own version of Armenian, um, which no one understands except us. Uh, and and um, we're, we're also more influenced by the Soviet, um, like um, Id identity, I don't know, the Soviet stuff, because we've been kind of like immersed into that more than the greater Armenia. There's been this, like we've been, it, it felt like they've been trying to pull us apart and we've been trying to, to stay together. So like that push and pull has always kind of affected the dynamics of, first of all, our relationship with the Armenia proper and our own identity because we, we do identify as Armenian. I myself, I'm not very religious. My parents are practicing, um, um, but I do feel, you know, a strong connection to um, our traditions, the language. Many Armenians there speak fluent Russian and uh, that, um, I think has caused some controversy with the recent, you know, adopting Russian as an official language thing for Armenians and also for, for us a little bit. Um, there has been um, many controversies throughout the war as well, you know, with, mm. with unfair things happening in our own communities. Um, there has been well, conflicts also between, you know, um within the country which have caused a bunch of pain and suffering uh, for some but the identity is shaped by um 
our borders. Uh, the, my family has lived there for six generations. Um, and they all have, you know, um, the, the family stories have traveled um, through, the, through the word of mouth and everything. And um, they, they remember, they always remembered where they came from. And they always told like their own stories. Um, the, they, I remember my great, great, great grandmother telling a story about her Turkic neighbors. I'm not sure they were actually Azeri or Turkish, um, but she always had them, um, like she wanted to have good relationship with them, but she also didn't trust them fully. But they were neighbors, they were like hanging out all the time. Um, but there was like, because she, she was a survivor of the um, Shoshi massacre. So she was, she wanted to, but like she was quite reserved. Um, and I think that has been like kind of passed down through generations. Like you want peace, but you've seen this, you know, so many times. So how do you do that? So there is this. In, like you don't know what step you need to take how do you build that trust and um, my sister is currently making a, a documentary about um, like the current state of the affairs um, after like post-war Artsakh situation it's called uh, the desire to live and she's interviewing um, different people from different communities and every time you speak to them, they say that they want peace, that they would prefer to have no more wars ever, ever again, because they've seen too many and it's very traumatizing. So there is a great desire to, to build peace, to be able to coexist, but they don't know how. So I think that has been essential and central to our own regional identity. Um, that has, I think, shaped everyone. I think I spoke for too long, <laughs> a bit rambly too. I didn't uh, plan on saying anything, but um, okay, I've done that now. So thank you. Thank you so much, Narik. Um, no, actually you haven't spoken for, for too long at all. Uh, I just wanted to say that um, so far, for example, in our meetings, we, we haven't really reached out to um, Artsakhi voices to Armenians from Nagorno-Karabakh because we felt maybe uh, it's, you know, it's too soon or it's um, still even more uh, sensible for them than for any other. That's why we, we have kept the focus of the talks um, like on, okay, on the Armenian point of view, like, and the Azerbaijani point of view as of, in this case, we only had one question about the conflict. Um, but of course, I mean, it's it is very interesting and very necessary for the the voices from from Nagorno Karabakh, from Artsakh, to also be heard, uh, because sometimes it's surprising to, as I've seen in your sister's videos, to the, the, what they are saying is so different from what you would ex maybe sometimes expect them to say. I think many of us also like saw the video of this boy Artur. He's from Martuni, and he. he and, like his message in the end, I think it was very touching for everyone who saw it. So thank you so much tonight for, for sharing your, your opinion. Um, oh, there's a, a message from Dead Soul. Maybe uh, Dead Soul, uh, maybe you wanna ask yourself or the question to Gnatic or we can go to Brandon. Brandon? Yeah, sure. Hello, everybody. Um, so I currently attend San Diego State, and one of the classes I'm taking is about the US-Mexico border. And one of the first things we learn is how the borders of San Diego and Tijuana, they're very inter interdependent of one another, culturally, economically. So um, I don't know if this is in your guys' area of expertise, um, but, but I mean, I know, um, uh, Gaudina, you specialize in borders. Um, so is there a way to build this interdependence between these two national identities while making it equitable? Because one, one of the things about 
the U U.S. Mexico border is that the level of interdependence creates a bunch of inequities in terms of who benefits uh, the most. So, over the next decade, are there any concrete steps that the two nations can take in order to form economic, cultural, um, social inter interdependence with one another? Brandon, I love that example, actually, because being in Arizona, um, sorry, I just jumped in, that's okay. But being in Arizona um, and living, you know, this this is former Mexican territory, right? And so it like forced me to rethink borders. So I just like happened to like, literally walk into this theoretical and like physical understanding of it, which is kind of fascinating. Um, and while I'm not an economic um, economist or a business person, so I can't really speak to how can both or all sides of the borders that say, how can we do this? How can we build this? From my understanding and from what I've read um, in other projects and, and, and lots of different um, scholars have analyzed different, and I can't think of them off the top of my head, but there were a couple of examples where because of the way the borders were redrawn, uh, I think it was the, um, and I don't wanna misquote it right now, but there was uh, border villages where the way that the border was drawn, um, that inequity that you're talking about, water distribution um, didn't reach the other side of the border. And so that, that village that was there that relied on that water no longer had a water source, which was, and nobody in the center, like whether, I don't know about from the Baku side, I don't know from the Armenian side, did they, were they aware of that happening like that? Um, and I think it was on the, on, the, on the Armenian side of the border that the water wasn't reached. I can't remember the specific example. So I apologize, but there are a lot of these types of incidences where the way the borders were drawn, all of a sudden it disrupted village, these village communities. And so it fascinated me because I was like, well, is Yerevan aware of this? You know, cross-border shooting, even when that happens all the time on all sides. Uh, one of the border villages that I went to, which is where I focused on when I was in Armenia the past year, I went to the, these border villages where um, you could see the border or the, and, and whether it's the Turkish border or the Azerbaijani border um, and the teachers, like they, li they actually lived that moment, right? So for example, we were going, coming home from a field trip with the kids and um, the, the, it was kind of late at night. It was a Saturday evening, seven o'clock ish and the lights were kind of down and you could see this um, piece of exhibit that I put in or data I put in my exhibit um, the bus driver turned the lights off and I'm sitting in the front of this bus with these kids and the teachers and I was like, well, we turned the lights off. And some of these roads in those areas, if you've been there, they're not real roads. They're like, you know, sand and dirt and it's not paved. So it's kind of unsafe. And then the, maybe it's the American in me that I was like, oh my God, like, shouldn't we turn the lights on? And that's, again, that's me thinking being American, I think. And so eventually I'm like, okay, is this, should I ask, should I not? And eventually I was like, you know, I'm just wondering, um, we turned the light off and I don't know, you know, it's kind of, is it safe to drive without the lights on? And, and I felt so embarrassed right after that. And it remind it really put me in my place. And I had a lot to learn right there. The, the, the drive, and this was in the Davos region. Um, the driver said, do you see the, and he pointed really far into the distance and he pointed some lights within the mountain range. And um, I said, yeah, I see the lights. He goes, okay, that's an Azerbaijani village right over there. And if they see our, our car driving by right now, um, they might shoot at us. They might, uh, and I'm responsible for these kids. So I'm gonna turn the lights off. I know how to get, I know how to get home. Don't worry about it. And it was just like this moment of, oh shit, you know, like this is the reality of living on the border. And so while, while all the sides are fighting and I'm sure there's probably stories on the Azerbaijani side, I haven't been, I can't go to Azerbaijan obviously. And so I, I can't collect or hear these stories or um, I haven't really heard people speak out about it, but I'm sure there are. And so the question is, do you know, are we aware that we put our own people in these types of contexts? And I'm not even speaking about within Gharapak, right? Because my research, unfortunately, the fellowships, again, because it's this conflict is so politicized, we don't, we, we don't allow State Department funds to go to Gharapak, you can't go. <laughs> so I wasn't allowed. And that's one of my limitations, in my opinion, to be able to get that context. And so um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but I do think that the, um, there are the inequities, perhaps the um, business and agricultural, uh, those kinds of folks can come together, the specialists on all sides of the borders when they're ready to. Um, I do have one other story where on the Shirak side of the border, um, the Armenia-Turkey border, um, the border village I went, that, that area, 
you know, the watchtower was very visible from the school entrance. And um, the teacher, one of the teachers I was following, she was the English language teacher. She was actually a Baku Armenian refugee that their homes, they were swapped homes. And um, she said a lot of foreigners come through here and they wanna go through the border and they think it's open. And then this border area, um, the villagers here, she said they have access. They can go out, they can go outside of the border, believe it or not. So like, it's kind of strange. The border is very clearly marked, but those villages have, you know, if we call it closed, those villagers actually have access to the farmland right on the other side. So luckily we, our means are still allowed that, especially in that village area, which so needs, like they're, it's, they need these types of ways to survive. Um, and these borders have disrupted that very much so disrupted the ways they've lived. And so it was really fascinating for me to be able to see that and hear it. Um, and yeah, absolutely. How do we do, how do we bring this up in the conversation? I'd be very curious to see how we, how the government officials would definitely take this on because it is, it is very important. Absolutely. I don't know if I answered your question at all. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you gave a great perspective. Thank you. Yeah, so, so if I may, um, just to add to what Galina said, like generally, of course, we know like the, the again, like the, the example that comes to mind is uh, how actually the European Union started uh, and how like the exchange in coal and steel uh, industries of France and Germany, how it contributed to the establishment of the European Union and, and finally like regional community. Uh, but when we talk about the South Caucasus, there are indeed good researchers, and I hope that they will be taken into account in terms of the um, exchange, both in economy and environmental issues, uh, the issue of water uh, provision of the neighboring to Nagorno-Karabakh districts of Azerbaijan. Uh, they, uh, there might be a good example of how Sarsan Reservoir can be used. That's a, one point. Another one, I read it recently somewhere in the news that uh, the like the fact that the territories were reshaped and uh, Shusha uh, is uh, like located very close and it's now dependent on the electricity from coming from Nagorno-Karabakh and uh, there is I think like there are talks about exchange of electricity and gas. Uh, generally speaking, like there there is a good basis for economic exchange between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Uh, I hope that borders will be open and it will uh, work not only in particular issues of, you know, like water exchange or uh, gas and electricity exchange, but it's all, it will also generally develop a business sector, uh, exchange between rural, you know, like uh, people, residents, uh, example that we had in uh, Sadahlo market in Georgia. Uh, unfortunately, it was co co closed in uh, 2006, if I'm not mistaken. So indeed, economic uh, cooperation and transactions, they do work. Uh, but um, if you ask like theoretical analysis, um, just like to explain it very uh, easily, like the functionalist idea like that indeed economies can work for uh, peace resolution. Uh, it is challenged by uh, many other experts and theoreticians. Uh, one of them is um, Charles Kapchen, for example, in his book, How Enemies Become Friends. He analyzed uh, 20 cases in which uh, societies that used to be enemies uh, including even the like case of civil war in America. He analyzed it as a case of war between two communities. And he came to a conclusion that economy can be a factor, but it's not a defining factor. It should be accompanied by many other steps. Uh, and these steps include first and foremost, uh, political will of the leadership of the political elites uh, that will like send a message and like as, as we discussed it earlier, like send some like message of rapprochement and reconciliation that they are eager to, to do this. That's why like uh, it is great to see that uh, 
like even in the statement of uh, 10th November, there was a case like the, in Article 9 was mentioned that the borders will be open. I hope they will be open soon, but it, it will not be enough. Uh, it requires uh, a more comprehensive approach and more uh, many more steps to be taken. Thank you both. Thank you. So uh, if we have any other question, if not, we're already like reaching our, our time limit. So uh, we have some comments. Um, we have a comment from OJ saying that as someone who has trained Armenians, Azerbaijanis and Georgians, what usually happens is that Armenians and Azerbaijanis end up congregating together. The Georgians usually sit alone, <laughs> uh, which is something that we can also see on, I remember like Arpis, uh, short film last week, right? Like she was also showing us like how in the end the Azerbaijanis and the Armenians were like making a subgroup within Georgia. Um, and then, uh, yeah, then we maybe can go to closing remarks from our guests and our co-host. So um, who would like to go first? Aidan, maybe? Sure. Um, yeah, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Nazarin and uh, Garina for coming on and uh, speaking about this um, fascinating topic. I, I personally find it extremely interesting and I think uh, also educational um, to learn about. And also thanks for providing all the uh, sources to uh, reading materials. We're also going to share about it later on um, on social media. Yeah, thanks a lot for coming on and for sharing your uh, yeah your knowledge with us. I also want to thank Nazrin and Karine. This was a very very interesting uh, discussion. There is just so much to talk about, and I think each aspect of this topic could be broken down, and you could have a separate discussion on them. So, thank you so much for giving us sort of this very informative and interesting perspectives, both as academics and personally. Um, I also, again, would like to thank Diego and Aidan, my teammates, and everyone who joined us today. Nasreen or Karine, would some of you like to say like some final words? Uh, I want to thank the organizers. Thank you very much for uh, for this initiative and for this particular topic. Thanks for inviting us. It was really very interesting to talk. Hope to hear more from you. Uh, thank you for what you are doing. Okay, last but not least, um, I, I agree. I uh, thank you guys. Thank you, everybody. It was very interesting to learn from you all. I appreciate the audience, the participants questions and, and input. Um, I appreciate also to hear a voice from the conflict territory itself. So thank you for um, speaking up, Kanadik. Um, and I do follow your sister's videos. If I have a, a second to share um, a very quick link so that in case the audience wishes to uh, visit my um, gallery that I was describing earlier or throughout this conversation, I'd love to um, give folks the opportunity to um, take a look and see some of the stuff, the stories that I've collected. I don't know if the organizers would give me that. Sure, you, you shall be able to put now in the chat and we will also share the link on our oh, okay. social right. media, but now in the chat is available. It's Got open. it, thank you. All right. so the, that's the link right there. Um, and if, um, if anybody wants to, um, I, I, I would be happy to share a couple of the exhibits. Um, and then if you're, you, you have anything to share from there, we can, or if anyone else has any questions feel free to, um, my information is on my website. Arno, you're messaging me, by the way, not. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you, Garine. I'm trying to find the desire to leave link to share as well. Oh, I have, I found one video, so I'll just share that one and for people who are asking. And we will also, oh, sorry, I will put it on the public chat. We'll also share it uh, probably in, in our social media as well. Mm -hmm. So thank you everybody for joining us today. Thank you, my co-hosts. Thank you, Nasrin and Garnier for this uh, very 
uh, informative and um, good conversation. Thank you, Gnadik, as well, and everybody in the audience for your participation and your questions and for your support. And looking forward to see you in our next meeting. So thank you, everybody, and have a nice day. This was nice. Bye. The, the floor is yours. Where? Oh, I thought you was going to say something. <laughs> okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. -bye. Have a nice time. <laughs>